Jacobs and joined on this episode of Rinkwide by Farhan Lalji of TSN. Farhan, you've been in the TV business for decades, but we're going to try to make you a YouTube sensation tonight. <laughs> Hi, we're happy to have you along for the first episode of Rinkwide streaming Kirk live. Couldn't have helped us with a win, though. No, uh, we're excited to explore the opportunities that this platform is going to provide. The podcast, it's the same content with new delivery and distribution options. Still a podcast for those that want to consume it that way on their own schedule. But really excited to be back in the live post game space to harness that emotion that comes with every win, but that also comes with losses like this one. To the LA Kings. Yeah, and once again, the Canucks haven't beaten a playoff team for about a month now, right? March 9th was the last time they did it against Winnipeg, and the this game followed a familiar script to the LA Kings. They've now given up the first goal in all four games they've played against them. A um, couple of power play goals early in this game. You know, just a week and a half ago, we were lauding this penalty kill about it, just how impressive it had been. Defensively, their structure was supposedly so good. And since then, in the last couple of games, it's just fallen apart on both ends of that. So they give up the two early power play goals. And then much like the Vegas game the other night, every time it looked like they got a sniff, they gave up another one right away. And, um, you know, it, it just looks like a team that at times goes to sleep, at times plays careless, and certainly at times a team that looks like it has no business having any success in the Stanley Cup playoffs, which are just right around the corner right now. And then in behind them, you got the Edmonton Oilers now. After their win in Calgary, they're nipping at the Canucks' heels. They're three points back. The Oilers control their own destiny because of the game in hand and the fact that they play the Canucks. So the Canucks certainly control theirs as well, but just so many things that we've been talking about in the last couple of weeks that are recurring themes for this team. And if they don't get it fixed, you better enjoy those first couple of parties because it's all you're going to get. Yeah, they could have used to save too, and certainly goaltending is becoming a topic uh, with Thatcher Demko back on the ice. That's the good news on that side of the, the coin. The other is that Casey Smith has now lost – Four straight games. The two wins the Canucks have in the last couple of weeks have both been Arthur, Arthur Silov's victories. And Casey DeSmith lost to the Kings twice, to the Dallas Stars. And we know what happened in Vegas at the outset of this road trip. The Canucks go one and two on this three-game roadie. And then you've got the defending Stanley Cup champs who aren't going to be in a particularly good mood after getting shelled for six goals in the third period in Arizona last night. Vegas' next game here in Vancouver on Monday. That's the next game for the Canucks. But let's go back to the start of this hockey game because... Teddy Bluger gets called for a slashing penalty deep in the offensive zone, chopped the stick out of a Kings defender. I didn't have a problem with that call. A little bit of a lack of discipline on the part of Bluger. The Kings score. That's when Adrian Kempe, uh, the snapshot off right wing, and it looked like Casey DeSmith was drifting there, and Nikita Zadorov didn't do a whole lot to help his goaltender take away a shooting lane. But one nothing on their heels, down early, and then I, I kind of thought Dakota Joshua got a bit of a raw deal. Uh, he runs into Akil Thomas at the benches, and yes, he gets his hands up into the face of the Kings forward. I thought there was enough of a response from Thomas that in a one other game where the Kings had just scored on a power play, that the referees could have taken the easy way out there and given them coincidental minors, yep. but Dakota Joshua puts it in the referee's hands. Like, he gets his gloves up into Thomas's face. They put him in the box. The Kings score the second time. That was Doughty in the slot, the, the one-timer. And five minutes into this hockey game, you know, the Canucks know the importance of these games against the Kings and trying to get out in front. Not only have they given up the first goal to the Los Angeles Kings in all four of the meetings this year, far and they didn't play with a lead for a single second. The one win they had was overtime. Yep. And in that game, they had to chase and finally got onto even terms. But in this game, this was an uphill battle all night long when they spotted the Kings, the two early power play goals. Yeah, and then Brock Besser did get them back into it. And then when you looked at this game, you know, through the end of the first period, you, you look at it from a five-on-five -five perspective, as the Canucks are wont to do. And the Canucks actually played pretty well, outshot them, outchanced them. But ultimately, the, the penalty kill counts. So when you look at both of those goals, Casey to Smith looks small. And guess what? Casey to Smith is small, right? Yeah. He's a smaller yeah. goaltender. And I think he's been so aggressive. Uh, you know, in a number of the games where he was having success that he came out, was able to cut down angles and he was playing very deep in the net. You talk about that first goal, Jeff, where, you know, we thought that he got caught too far on the left side, but maybe it was Zadorov's responsibility to take away the other lane so that DeSmith just has to play half the net. Uh, Zadorov didn't do his part. And and again, I mean, DeSmith gave up all sorts of room. But then in the Doughty shot as well, Doughty doesn't get all of it right? Wide open in the slot. But again, DeSmith is playing real deep in his net. The Canucks defensively make a poor read and it's a top corner shot again with a lot of space and, and he can't make that save. So 
to me, I'm getting Spencer Martin vibes because when we saw Spencer Martin last year, he looked really good early on when he was getting those spot starts. But then all of a sudden, Thatcher Demko got injured. He had to go in and get an extended run, and it just wasn't there for him. And quite frankly, I think they should have started Archer Sillops. And I know that that was a bit of a debate. And, you know, in fairness to DeSmith, he, he's had the tougher matchups. Sure. Oh, yeah. And Sillops had the two games against non-playoff teams. He played really well in those games, but he's a bigger goaltender. He was playing well. He was trending well, whereas DeSmith in his last couple of games, maybe he wasn't. I know Talkin felt a level of loyalty, felt that DeSmith had earned this start. But he also said this morning, uh, or maybe yesterday, that he also feels that there might be another window for Silovs to get another start. So maybe that happens against a playoff team on Monday. But the Canucks need better goaltending than they've gotten from Casey to Smith in their last two starts, especially on the penalty kill. Your goaltender's got to be your best killer. Their structure hasn't been good. They're giving up lanes. They're getting collapsed deep. You need your goaltender to make a save. And, you know, you look at the expected goals in this game, and at five on five, they were less than three, or sorry, less than two. Uh, and Casey to Smith didn't do his part. Can't blame it all on him. This team played poorly in front of him, but they need their goaltender. Final shots were 42-29. The Canucks got 42 shots. All this talk about breaking down the Kings, uh, the 1-3-1. The Canucks score three goals, and a lot of times out on the road, three goals should be enough to get you into overtime at least, get you something, but uh, not when you're giving up six the way the Canucks ultimately did, and they trade shorthanded goals there in the third period. So They gave up six to Vegas, too. Yeah. No, so I know all the quality this, teams are showing. Right. I mean, the story around this Canuck team for the last couple of weeks has been, oh, they're struggling to score goals, but – They've got this defensive structure. Well, in two of the three games against the two good teams on this road trip, structure went out the window, and they've got five games to go. So, you know, not only do they have the Oilers breathing down their neck, and next Saturday they're in Edmonton for a game that probably will determine top spot in the Pacific Division. But more than that for the Canucks, it's five games left here to figure out who's going to be healthy, when's Demko going to be back, will they get Elias Lindholm back, and can they rediscover all the things that have made them a good team for much of this season, but we know the struggles since the All-Star break, and those have been underscored here uh, on this road trip, and, and even at the tail end of the long homestand against those playoff teams. That, uh, that's that been the problem for the Vancouver Canucks. So you can understand the angst in the market. Uh, special teams have been an issue. We'll get to the stat that stands out a little bit later on, and uh, it touches on penalty killing for the Vancouver Canucks. I just want to go back to Dakota Joshua, because he hadn't played against the Kings this season, mm -hmm. and I was excited before the game, because I, I just I realized, just moments before face-off, that he was out for the first three with the hand injury. And what do we always talk about uh, the Kings and time and space and, you know, playoff-style hockey? I thought, all right, here's a chance for Dakota Joshua to, you know, make an impact the way that he did uh, in the game against Anaheim the other day, the, the home game at the tail end of the home stand. Discipline. Obviously, we talked about the penalty that he took. The Kings scored to make it 2-0. And then whatever he said to the officials, obviously, uh, they said, I hope you're happy in the penalty box there because you're going to sit for another 10. And, you know, we've seen this from the Canucks before that, uh, you know, a month ago, Rick Tockett was lamenting the number of penalties. It was the stupid stick penalties that he was talking about that. That's not this case, but discipline. Come playoff time. Like Dakota Joshua, zip it. You're already in this 2 nothing hole. You can't. Like, I don't know what he said, but I hope he got it out of his system because he can't be doing that. Well, playoff time. and he he's proven he's an indispensable player for this team. And I know the standard on penalties is a little different in the playoffs, but when the Canucks penalty kill was operating really well and they had killed 12 straight, that was over five games. What does that tell you? They're not taking a lot of penalties. Yeah. When they take a lot of penalties, they're not good enough, right? Especially when you don't have your starting goaltender. So I, I don't think they've helped themselves during the stretch with the number of additional penalties they've taken. You mentioned Talkett has lamented the types of penalties that they're taking. Uh, a lot of those same types of, of stick penalties that they got in trouble with earlier. So... Um, you know, and, and Joshua, yeah, you're in the penalty box for 10 minutes. Your team's not shorthanded during that time, but this is an important player for this team, you know, and now they've gotten Joshua back. They don't have Demko, you know, so this is a team that overall has been really healthy, but they don't have it in them to necessarily overcome a lot of adversity. They need these guys back if for no other reason, just some mental health, right? Like they need to just feel like when the day that Thatcher Demko steps onto the ice, Everybody in this Canuck uniform is going to get about three inches taller, right? Like, that's just going to happen. Even Connor Garland? Even Connor Garland. Well, I want right? to see that. So, uh, <laughs> like, that's going to happen, but that's kind of how fragile this team is. They just need any level of, of mojo to kind of get themselves up, and I think that's what it's going to take right now because 
as long as it's same, same, guess what results we're going to get? Same, same, which is not to suggest they need to bring Thatcher Demko back before he's ready because that's just not the recipe. Like they need to make sure that Thatcher Demko's knee is not just physically ready, but that he is mentally ready, which means he's got full belief in it, right? Lindholm, uh, you know, I, I think Demko is likely to come back sooner than Lindholm and Lindholm wasn't very good for the, I'm sorry, probably strong, but he was just kind of average, at least offensively. He wasn't very good, but in other stages or in other areas of the game, he was good, but will them getting him back just allow them to say mentally, Oh yeah, yeah, we got our guy back. We got a guy back. Like well, they, they we, kind of are so fragile right now. They need these lifts, right? But we talked about Lindholm and the fact that okay, he hasn't been great offensively. Where has he contributed? Yeah. Penalty kill, and it's taken Face a hit off. since he's been out of the lineup. And absolutely, yep. and and Demko too. Uh, you know, through all of this, and and look, six three doesn't look good on the Canucks. The fact that the Kings take seven of eight points from the Vancouver Canucks uh, on the regular season, they had the Canucks number. We talked about the one when the Canucks did get uh, came in overtime. All that said, 2-0, the quick start for the Kings. The final 15 minutes of the first period, at even strength, as you mentioned, they settled down, they settled into the game. Brock Besser gets his 39th goal of the season midway through the third. Far, and you can make an argument that the game kind of turned on an Elias Pettersson breakaway on an incredible pass from Vasily Podkolzin. Yeah. And, you know, most of this season, you'd say that's the guy you want to have the puck on his stick in that kind of opportunity yeah, I think he got a decent look away. Um, didn't score, obviously. But if he does score, he's got a two-point first period. People want like, this guy to make an impact in big games. Yeah, he made a decent play to, on, on the Besser goal. Uh, but that was one of the turning points in this hockey game. Is that, you know They didn't have those kind of clear-cut looks. And Pedersen gets sprung on a partial breakaway. And if he scores there, they've erased the deficit. It's a two-all game. They've got momentum. They put the Kings back on the heel. It didn't happen. And then uh, early in the second period, the Kings extend that lead. Well, and then when they, you know, for talking about Pedersen, right? Uh, six shots in this game, right? So that's, I guess that's a positive. And, and the baseline, the bar for Pedersen has been completely lowered. Like we just look at, oh, he had some shots and he had three hits. And, oh, maybe he's getting a little better and he's got a bit a bit more going on. I, I don't know, right? Like, I don't know what it's going to take. Uh, uh, Pedersen before might be a little bit more deliberate with that shot or he might try a deke. Yeah, there was a defenseman coming down, but it almost felt like a bit of a panic shot, at, you know, yeah. in that moment. Like, it, it thought he could have done a little bit more with it, but he's he's clearly not feeling it right now. Um, so I, I don't know what it's going to take. I don't know how he's going to turn it on. I mean, we every post-game show we do, every post-game show you and Earth do, that's the conversation. When are they going to get more out of Pedersen? And everybody is looking for some signs of life to say, oh, yeah, yeah, he, he was better tonight. He was better tonight. I don't know. Maybe he was. I, I, I don't know. It's hard to say. He's gone eight without a goal now, so that is uh, not an encouraging sign with no. five games remaining. But you know who else has kind of gone quiet is JT Miller. A little bit. And he, had again, points. he had a point streak. But that's, we know from Pedersen, you can get quiet look, points. JT's up to 97 points. He had the assist on the Dakota Joshua goal. So it wasn't all bad for Joshua, but certainly didn't like the start to his hockey game. But yeah, I mean, Joshua scores seven minutes into the third, makes it a 4-2 game. And you're thinking there's lots of time here. This team has been able to generate offense, not necessarily against the Kings, but they weren't out of it at 4-2. Uh, unfortunately, as you said, uh, kind of like Vegas the other night, it just felt when the Canucks crept close enough to the Kings, Kings would step on the gas again and, and kind of squish the Canucks out of the talking game. But but JT has a seven-game point streak, which kind of surprised me, actually, when yeah. I was going through the game notes. He only has one goal in his last six, and that was the one set up by Garland uh, against the Dallas Stars, uh, tail end of the homestand as well. So, you know, this team is going to have trouble winning hockey games if, you know, it's two leading offensive producers in JT Miller and Elias Pettersson uh, aren't scoring with any sort of regularity, and that's been the problem for Pedersen. But JT has kind of gone a little bit quiet, even though the, the points are still there. It just doesn't feel like he's having the impact on games that he has for most of the most of this season. 19-6 was the Corsi numbers when, for JT Miller tonight. And, and again, like, I, I don't disagree with you. And sometimes these stats can be deceiving. But, you know, you, you look at it, and yeah, they they absolutely need more from him. And, and I just feel that that line right now with Garland and Joshua is set up to dominate and it's not dominating right um you know you, you'll get flashes you'll get spurts yeah but we're we're not seeing dominant shift after shift high danger scoring chance after high danger scoring chance we're not seeing it as as much as we should because this team really has been loaded up to become a two-line team and that's if you believe that Elias Pettersson can 
that line is one of the of those lines that you know it has to be when you know, there is more expected from these guys they need to find a way to produce and i don't know is this the right setup for this group right i mean do they need to get back to a situation where Um, uh, Ho Hoaglander and Pedersen together with one other player. When maybe Lindholm, when he comes back in the lineup, I know that wasn't great before, but you know whatever it takes, maybe you find a way because one of the strengths of that third line when it was constructed previously was the matchups they got. So, so I don't know, but you know one of the things that you bring up, we talk about Pedersen not scoring, and then early in the second, um, LA makes it three to one, and it was a goal that was really close to offside. And we were debating whether a challenge should have been made there. And I know that Rick and the talking has put his lines in a blender from time to time, but is he doing enough coaching, right? Like there are moments like when you gave up the two power play goals, is there a moment there to take a timeout and reset your team? Now they did play well after going down two nothing. Right. So maybe that wasn't needed. Um, you give up those early goals or you go down four one. Is there a moment where you can change goaltenders to try to just shake up your team? Casey, we're not blaming he, you. Yeah. You, you he know, has like, not. Had the hookout all season. Thatcher Demko has left two games. The opener against the Oilers way back when he was dehydrated in the Winnipeg game when he got hurt. Rick Talkett has not had an in-game coaching decision goaltender change all season long. Like, and that speaks to how much winning well, they've done. I'm but not hound, I'm not hounding him specifically on the goaltending change, but just those lack of touch points. Yeah. And you know, I I kind of think he should have challenged that offside, but I get why he didn't. The penalty kill is just giving up two goals. <laughs> yeah. You don't yeah. want to go through that again, like given how bad the penalty kill has looked. And how bad the Smith looked in, in there as well. So you better be a thousand percent sure. But it just feels like other than throwing the lines in a blender, we haven't necessarily seen that type of in-game coaching. And I don't want to be overly critical. Like I think Rick Talkett could win coach of the year. I think that um, you know, prior to the all-star break, if nothing else, this team has established a level of structure and uh, an attention to detail defensively. And they were they built up a, a cushion in the standings that still may carry them into first place in the division, but there's, it still feels like in game more could happen. I asked about because after the Colorado game when they had the three nothing lead and it got away, and I, I remember asking him at practice whether it was the next day or that week about just philosophically his thoughts on using a timeout to try to settle his team down to either you know berate them and try and light a fire out of them or just to calm the game down and slow it down and try and take momentum away. He is a believer in keeping the timeout for late game strategy. But he did admit that there were some times throughout the year where he probably thought, in hindsight, he he could have and should have. I thought the Colorado game was one. And I'm with you. at 2 nothing here early. But he also said he doesn't really need to call a timeout that there are TV timeouts. There are enough stoppages where if he feels that he has to run up and down the bench, he can do that. So just that's kind of in you know a little bit of his thinking, uh, what, three weeks ago uh, on that topic. But I, I'm with you. I just thought 2-0. Uh, you know, the, the, we know the storyline around this club and, and it's play against playoff teams and Casey to Smith and his play against playoff teams. And, you know, you ask that question, like, should this have been a still off start? And it's hard to sort of argue with that. I think it's pretty clear now that Arthur Silovs will get the, the start against the, the Golden Knights on Monday. And that's stepping up a huge weight class for a guy that's seen Anaheim and Arizona. Uh, but you know, you can only face the team in front of you and he's done his job there. So we'll see if he's ready, but, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. Like, if Thatcher Demko is not ready by midweek, you know, what do you do? Like, if Demko is not available for the game next week in Edmonton, uh, who gets the call there? We're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit. But goaltending was an issue, uh, and it has been. And maybe it's too much to expect from the backup to step into these big situations. But Casey Smith's been around the block. I mean, this guy, you know, 32 years of age, he's at times had to step into these kinds of situations. Whatever the case, it uh, wasn't a great night for him. But also, like you look at some of the goals, like the Fiala goal that makes it four to one, not Carson Soucy's finest moment oh in a game oh where my goodness. Uh, he and Tyler Myers struggled mightily in the first period, even though we talked about the Canucks sort of taking over five on five, uh, not when they were on the ice. And just about everything that could go wrong for Carson Soucy did uh, as he tried to track down Kevin Fiala on that four one goal. 
Yeah, and when you look at what this D looked like, and, and you know, Susie, you remember when he came back off injury, we just talked about what his record was and just how good he was uh, and how valuable he was. And, you know, he he certainly come down to earth a little bit. Here's one, because I think you and I have both been on the same page around Ian Cole, that, um, you know, there there have been some hiccups, I think, at times, not tonight, but at other times he struggled on the penalty kill. It, when, you, when you go back to them not being able to clear the puck at key times, quite often it's Ian Cole. Guess who killed it tonight? in Corsi and high danger scoring chances. They were like 70% with Ian Cole on the ice. Eight to one high dangers. I got with an assist Ian... on the Besser goal. Yeah, so so he bounced back. But, you know, I, I would like to see Zadorov get into the lineup because I do think structurally they're better when they've got three guys playing on the right side. Um, but they just don't have a ton of options. And when you talk about goaltending, this team's defensive staples haven't been good enough the last couple of weeks. And so at a time when they need their starting goaltender the most, He's not available to them, right? So it is difficult. I, I'm not saying that to blame Thatcher Demko. Like, you come back when you're healthy. But it's been a tough ask now because as much as Casey DeSmith in his last two to three games hasn't been as good, neither have the players in front of him. 22nd outright loss of the season for the Vancouver Canucks. 47, 22, and 8 now. They sit on 102 points. Edmonton up to 99 after its win in the Battle of Alberta. So, again, the Oilers are three back of the Canucks. They've got a game in hand, and they still have the head-to-head -head next Saturday. We should mention as well that with this win, the Los Angeles Kings, who've now won six in a row at home and have an absolutely tissue-soft schedule the rest of the way. They don't leave Southern California. Their only road game is across town in Anaheim. The Kings move past both Vegas and Nashville, so L.A. is going to spend the night in third in the Pacific Division, a point ahead of the Vegas Golden Knights. Vegas does have a game in hand there. Uh, Vegas and Nashville tied on 92 points. So Vegas is the first wild card right now. Nashville slides to wild card number two. 6 3 is the final score. The Los Angeles Kings defeat the Vancouver Canucks. You're watching the streaming live edition of Rink Wide Vancouver. To rink wide Vancouver 6 3. The Los Angeles Kings defeat the Vancouver Canucks. Jeff Patterson, along with Farhan Lolji. We're going to hear from Rick Tockett here in a sec. But before we do that, I uh, want to make mention of this event that you've probably heard by now, but we want you to join us on April 20th at the Hollywood Theater. Uh, Garrison Price crew, the Canucks Army guys as well. Saturday, April 20th, Hollywood Theater and Kits. Special tribute to our late friend Jason Botchford. And we had a great Botchford Project alumni event last night uh, it was great to catch up with all the young people that have gone through that program some who've already been able to uh, land full-time work quadrelli's my boss now that's how quickly wow. life moves uh, i know uh even this, shave this event coming up on the 20th is presented by fountain tire it's called bro do your playoffs it's a media event celebrating the life and legacy of jason it's going to feature shared memories special guests an exclusive performance from the matinee and a celebration of vancouver's triumphant return to the playoffs. Yeah, playoff hockey is coming this way. We'll see ultimately what it looks like when they get up and running. 
Uh, make the shift to more savings. Save up to 25% on select tires until April 20th, plus a $50 bonus off any service of $150 or more. Book your appointment at fountaintire.com. Some restrictions do apply. This event's in support of the BC Mental Health Foundation. Tickets are only 10 bucks. So join us on April 20th for a memorable experience where every ticket purchase contributes to making a positive impact on the community. Get your tickets at nationgear.com. C.A. Going to have our three stars of the game, the staff that stands out, but uh, want to hear from Rick Tockett. End of the night, end of this road trip. Canucks go one for three with the win in Arizona, but the losses to division mates, Vegas and Los Angeles. Two of those teams will be playoff bound. Arizona is not. So uh, again, it's a struggle right now for the Vancouver Canucks against uh, some of these teams that are headed to the postseason. Here's Rick Tockett after the game at Crypto.com. Tough to play catch up and talk down to early. Yeah, the two power play goals early, you know, a little undisciplined, and then you're chasing the game. I know it seemed like it was a Vegas game. You guys were trying to play your way back and then give them a power play. No, the Vegas game weren't that bad, but we were we were in the game today. We had some chances. We uh, They converted. We didn't. They only had a couple chances in the first period. So you can look at the Swiss goals and think it's bad, but I kind of actually like the effort. Guys tried hard. Just too many egregious mistakes, you know. Um, then it's in your net, you know. Um, but yeah, uh, we had a lot of chances, just didn't convert. They did. We've been talking and asking you a lot about sort of the team being in, in a slump, for lack of a better term. But it's like 22 games now where you've been a 500 team. Does that concern you? No, I just look at this game. I don't care about what's in the past. We got five games before the playoffs start. So you analyze this game. I don't care what happened in the past. Uh, tonight, like I said, we gave gave them too much, um, like bad. We didn't give them a lot of stuff, but when they did, they their conversion rate was great. We didn't. We had we had some chances. We had a couple breakaways. We had somebody in the high slot, uh, and we you know if we connect and then we gave them those free beers early. It's two nothing. So no, I, I'm just analyzing this game. Do you have a target for uh, Thatcher returning? Uh, same as always. It's, uh, I don't have an exact date, but it's, it's fairly soon. Probably had some better looks than I thought. Maybe more movement. We had nine or ten shots, yeah. Just conversion, you know. Uh, we didn't com- like, yeah. Better, it was better, but we got to convert us someplace. I mean, you, that's when you get ten, sh- ten shots, you got to convert. Maybe next game we will. So, but uh, I'm happy with the way the we got the shots. We just got to make sure we put them in now. There you go, Rick Tockett, uh, trying to find some positives out of 6-3 loss to the Los Angeles Kings. Officially nine shots in the power play, uh, but this kind of tells the story, Farhan. The Canucks went 0 for 9 on those nine shots they had with their power play. Kings were two shots, two goals on the power play. So uh, they were efficient, they were precise, and those two power play goals uh, generated the early 2 nothing lead. And I'm not sure what the bigger concern is right now, quite frankly, because I think for the longest time we were worried about this power play, but I think the penalty kill is a bigger concern right now. Uh, because when you look at just the the lack of ability on reads, uh, guys getting caught out of position, how easily that box collapses, and not necessarily to block shots. They just they're trying to take away lanes and they open up space up top. Uh, it, it feels like whatever decision they make isn't a good one. And then all of a sudden, you get a minute forty three on a five on three, and they were great, right? Denied a lot of entries, made plays at the blue line, were able to get pucks out. So you know it, it's hard to figure. And maybe a lot of people believe that as soon as Thatcher Demko comes back that having your goaltender back is going to make the penalty kill look great. But I do think it'll take a minute for, for Demko to get up to speed again. But, you know, they, they need to get better in that area as well. But So, I like, I, I don't know. Based on the last week, I, I, I'm sure that if you look at it from the All-Star break on and talk it right there, talked about the fact he's trying to avoid doing that and just focusing on this game, which special team is the bigger concern? Because right now, if the way both of their special teams are going, they have no shot. To, to get any kind of traction in the playoffs. Like, they've got to fix one or both of these in a hurry. Well, that leads us into our staff that stands out, and uh, regular listeners to the podcast know that uh, we come up with a staff that stands out after each and every Canucks game. So we've been doing it here all season long. 77 down, five remaining. And there you can see on your screen, if you're watching uh, here on YouTube, the staff that stands out, Canucks have allowed seven power play goals in their last five games. Two to the Dallas Stars, lost that game. Two to the Vegas Golden Knights the other night, lost that game. Two to the Los Angeles Kings, there's a theme here. Uh, they lost that one as well, and Arizona's only goal the other night picked them apart with the down low oh, yeah. and into the slot. So, uh, like The other teams are making it look easy. 
Right. Like, that's the hard part. Like when you look at these teams score, like it is great looks and they're able to move the puck around without any issue. And you look at the Canucks and everything looks hard. Yeah, and uh, you wonder what would it take to get Noah Juleson back in the lineup. I don't know that he's the savior here necessarily, but you know that is an area that he has been able to contribute. He's been yep. lauded by the coaching staff, and it's not working for the guys that are in there. Uh, you heard Rick Tockett asked uh, yet again about Thatcher Demko, and they're just not coming out with a date yet. Said so, soon, though. I mean, I know. I, it, look, it'll happen next week, right? We have to believe that it's going to happen next week. It's not necessarily going to happen Monday. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I, I think the middle of the week's a reasonable possibility. You want to get him, if you want to play him against Edmonton, you'd love to have him in one right. game before I, the Edmonton game. I think game. that's perfect world stuff that if you could, and I'd say ease him in against Arizona because they only scored one against the Canucks, but they scored seven against Vegas. Yeah. Uh, they've scored eight and five and six uh, prior to that. So they've been, you know, it's kind of loose hockey right now for them. Uh, but I still think that would be a good tune-up game for Demko if you're going to ride him into Edmonton and hope that somehow uh, you can pull off a victory against the Oilers and preserve that lead atop the Pacific Division again. It's down to three, and the Oilers uh, have a game in hand. Oilers don't play now until Wednesday, and then they finish with six games in nine nights. I wasn't even sure that that was possible in NHL scheduling, but that's how they finish. So they've got this crazy compressed schedule to finish up where the Canucks games are spaced out. They're done with their back-to-backs, but they've got Vegas, they've got Edmonton, they've still got a trip to Winnipeg as well before all is said and done. So the race is still very much on at the top of the Pacific Division. Want to get to our rink-wide Vancouver three-star selection, and these are our three stars. Sometimes they match up with the ones that are selected in the building. Sometimes they don't. In this case, the three stars on rink-wide, the three that were selected in the building, but in a slightly different order, right? Uh, in at crypto.com, they were Adrian Kempe, Kevin Fiala, Drew Doughty, as you can see on the screen. We're going Kempe, who had the two goals. He opened the scoring and then he closed it as he got in behind Quinn Hughes. Shorthanded effort, slipped at five hole on Casey DeSmith for his 27th goal of the season. The guy's what do you got- make of that last goal? Like, I was shocked to see Quinn Hughes get beat like that. And I know he, he was in for the entire power play and he logs a lot of minutes and that was late in the game, but I did not expect to see that. Yeah, I think it was. All offense, no defense at that stage of the game. Yeah. And Kempe's, I mean, the guy's got wheels. Yeah, and, he does. Uh, I do like this. Like, I don't love the 1-3-1, one, one, obviously, but I like the balanced scoring that the Kings have. And you saw it tonight with Kempe and Fiala. And, you know, Kopitar didn't score, but he had a couple of points. Mm-hmm. And uh, Trevor Moore did score, got to 30. You know, nobody talks about Trevor Moore. He leads their team in scoring, and he's got 30. I didn't like the hit on Quinn Hughes. Uh, led to a little... Uh, Scrum at center ice and a penalty, but, uh, you know, and Canucks sticking up for their captain as they should. Uh, but, yeah, just back to the three stars. Uh, Kempe was the first star with two goals and an assist. Drew Doughty, uh, you know, the old man still got it. For 15 yeah. goals in the season. Uh, he also had an assist, and there you go, the toothless smile of uh, Drew Doughty and Kevin Fiala with a goal and an assist. So multi And he, and he for- loves having success against the Canucks. Doughty. Oh, yeah, yeah absolutely. No, long history uh, between these two teams, a team like that. Um, yeah, but yeah, his uh, response to the door seven, of, seven of eight points the Kings take off the Vancouver Canucks, yeah. so just keep that in mind. If in fact it's amazing because yeah. they got hammered by Calgary the other day, like how, how does this happen? It feels like they're in their head, it feels like they're in like before the puck even drops, it feels like that whole one three one thing yeah. is now in the Canucks' head. Maybe you don't show Cam Talbot as much respect. Like again, they scored three goals on the road. I would like to have thought that you know. Fine, they wasted a Teddy Bluger goal, his first since the <laughs> first game out of the Christmas break against the Philadelphia Flyers, which uh, they forty wasted, games. They wasted that night as well. Uh, let's just quickly run through the Canuck goals because we haven't really talked an awful lot about them. But Brock's up to thirty nine, so yep. he's got five to go. He's going to get to forty, which you know we'll wait till he gets there before we congratulate him. But he set himself up now uh, to be a forty goal scorer in the NHL. So certainly something to watch over the final five. Uh, you know, nice play by Pedersen, a little bit of a delay there. Uh, recognized that Pierre-Luc Dubois without a stick yeah. and got the puck to Besser, who, you know, took the puck hard to the net and, you know, kind of bounced around, but it found its way in. But uh, you know, th- there was enough to like. And again, it made it a 2-1 game and gave the Canucks a little bit of life. And you thought maybe the outcome would be a little bit, bit different. Ultimately, it wasn't. But Yeah, I mean, when they got that goal and they made it 2-1, to one, it, it, the Canucks started carrying the rest of the play in the, in the first period. So... It, it was good, right? It did get them settled. You know, we talked about should Rick Talkett have called a timeout? He didn't. Didn't need to, it turned out, because they did wind up scoring later. And 
you know, I, but don't assume, right? Like, think of Kuzmenko last year. Sat on 39 for a while. That is true. No assumptions. You're right. He's got to get it, but I, I think he will. How about uh, Kuzmenko right now in Calgary? What is it, 17 points in 23 games with the Flames? Yeah, garbage time. I'm not too concerned about his point totals. Uh, Dakota Joshua up to 16. We talked about the tough start to the night for him, but that was a pretty play. Heronic uh, with a pass to Miller, mm-hmm. slashes through the D, and there is Dakota Joshua to uh, bang home a rebound. So 16 with the amount of time that he's missed. Uh, he'd have to you know, go on a little bit of a heater here down the stretch. To, to Irf get and I battle on Joshua all the yeah. time, right? Like we, we go back and forth on the Heronic Joshua thing and who should be the priority, and I'm all on team Dakota Joshua. So it's too bad Earth's not here because I, I told him I'm like the guy's he's a 20 goal 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 score right now. Oh, you can't he's not he doesn't even have 20. And anyway, so and the other one was Teddy Bluger uh banks it in off uh, a sprawling Cam Talbot after Nikita Zadorov. Uh, and the short handed goal, uh, as much as we dumped on the Canucks penalty kill in the first part of the game, they had the five on three there with Myers and Zadorov off, and Phil Aronic basically ran 25 seconds by himself yeah. in the corner uh you know it, it's not stuff that's gonna make a highlight reel but uh, the battle level was certainly amped up there and they that penalty kill looked pretty good and on top of that they score a shorthanded goal to again you know there's eight minutes left in the hockey game and it's five to three but they give they get uh they score a shorty and then they give up the shorthanded goal to Kempe. so it uh, cuts both ways on the night the connects power play goes 0 for three with the shorthanded goal against and the Kings' power play was two for four with the shorty against. So LA wins the special teams battle going away, and they win the hockey game as well. But the Zadorov situation on that was was pretty amusing because he sets up the shorthanded goal and within seconds takes a penalty for delay a game, yeah. making it a five on three. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you looked at him carrying the puck, right? Like that's the best of him when he can be so dangerous when he does that. You know, people want to get out of his way uh, and winds up setting up Teddy Bluger for that goal. So, um, you know, another player the Canucks are going to have to make a decision at the end of the season on, right? And, and you look at what his numbers potentially are. And for the Canucks, he's a bottom pair defenseman, and you you know you can't necessarily pay him that given the role that you're asking him to play. So, uh, you know, we'll see what you know what the future is for Zadorov with the Vancouver Canucks. But certainly, he's got an opportunity to be a big part of any potential playoff run. But a lot has to happen before this team can go in any kind of run. Well, five to go here in the regular season, starting on Monday against the Vegas Golden Knights, the fourth and final matchup between those teams this season. And you know, the Canucks were full value for a win at T-Mobile a month ago, but we know that they got their lunch handed to them and again ran into some penalty problems. That Orov got kicked out of that hockey game. Jack Eichel took over, Marcia so as well. So uh, we'll see what the Canucks can do in terms of a response, some redemption. Five remaining, Vegas and Arizona at home, then to Edmonton, a home game against Calgary. That'll be the home finale. They'll do their year-end awards and all those types of things on April the 16th, and then they wrap up the regular season on April 18th in Winnipeg. So three on the or two, three at home, two on the road uh, for the Vancouver Canucks over the final five. And you know, still this excitement about the return of playoff hockey to this city for the first time in nine years, but it does have to be tempered with results like this one and the one at uh, – at the fortress the other night against the golden Knights. You know, I've maintained that this is not just about a team that has not played in the playoffs, real playoffs, not the bubble stuff with no crowds, but understand this team missed out on games in March and April. Right. And it was those games to not just get yourself a playoff spot, but also to get into form before the playoffs, all of that has been lost. And I do think that that's showing to a point right now, right. That, you know, remember the season stopped. They were actually out of the playoffs from a point standpoint, but they were based on point percentage. And, you know, they wound up getting in with the expanded playoffs or the play in, as it were. Those games and those experiences were also missed. They're going through this for the first time. And, and that has to matter. And I don't know how long it'll take. I don't know if you're a player, what you need to all of a sudden flip the script and feel good about yourself, right? I mean, if you're Thatcher Demko or Elias Lindholm and you come back and you get to play a game and you play well, is that enough? If Pedersen in these last five games can score two goals, is that enough? Right? Like, what will it take for certain areas of this team to feel good about itself going into the playoffs? Because the playoffs, it, you know, it has happened to before. I mean, we, you know, the Canucks are battling Edmonton. I go back to 2006. That was a turtle derby to get into the playoffs. Like, those teams, Edmonton was awful down the stretch and gets to game seven of a Stanley Cup final. Right. And I'm not, you know, going to play the anything can happen card, <laughs> but for certain players, it might not take that much. And if all of a the sudden they show certain things, 
everybody else can rally around it. Like if you, if Pedersen gets, you know, in his, two goals in his last three games, is that enough? If Pedersen scores right now, I would take two goals in his well, final five. Well, if Pedersen games. gets a goal and an assist against Edmonton in a big game and the Canucks win, is that enough? Right? Like, what's it going to take for any particular player? Because we thought after the Buffalo game, oh, he's got it figured out, right? There was a little stretch there of a couple of games. Oh, it's it's done. It's he's back. And then all of a sudden, here we are. But what's it going to take? Because it, for some guys, it might not take much. Well, we'll see what the final five games have to offer for the Vancouver Canucks starting on Monday, and that's when we will be back to do our next edition of Rinkwider. Far and Gafar is going to join me and sitting in that chair that you are sitting in, but Far Hand. I call him our, Junior. For our first streaming episode, a return to live podcasting. Uh, great to have you in, so thank you for that. I grew uh, the playoff beard just we, for I, you. I saw that, and we've got a cast of thousands behind the cameras that you can't see here uh, for our first go-round to make sure that uh, we actually – uh, got to streaming, and uh, I think it's uh, that part of it technically has been a, a big success. So thanks to, to Grady and to Mike and Jacob uh, for their work behind the scenes. We're excited about this. Uh, hopefully the Canucks can hold up their end of the bargain, but uh, we will do this after each and every Canuck game, the final five of the regular season, and in the playoffs as long as they are around. But for Farhan, this is Jeff. Again, thanks so much for checking us out, uh, live streaming on YouTube and all of our social channels as well. We'll continue to work in some of your listener feedback. We just wanted to get through night number one in this format, so uh, keep the feedback coming, and we certainly will incorporate it into future uh, episodes of Rink-Wide Vancouver. The final score, one more time, the Los Angeles Kings 6, the Vancouver Canucks 3. You've been watching and listening to Rink-Wide Vancouver. 